Imagine it's 1976. You're an electronics nerd through and through. During the day, you think about opcodes. At night, you dream about diodes and capacitors. Just a few weeks ago, you finished building your very first computer, a kit from a company called Southwest Technical Products. You are now the coolest kid on the block, the envy of your small town. At least in your own mind. There's only one mild concern. Backups. You see, as things sit, your fancy new computer doesn't have a reliable way to save your work. Like I said, this is 1976. There's no backblaze. When you bought your system, you went with an ultra-modern Southwest CT1024 terminal. The 6800 was initially designed with a teletype in mind. Teletypes printed everything on paper, and even had a paper tape punch and reader that allowed for easy backup and retrieval. All that paper was your backup plan. However, you weren't one for noisy, oily, maintenance-heavy teletypes, so you'd chosen the CT1024 terminal instead. Last November, aware of the need for an affordable, reliable data storage solution, a group of engineers had gotten together in Kansas City, Missouri, and agreed on a standard method of encoding data to those nifty little compact cassettes. Southwest had followed through with their AC30 tape encoder, which, naturally, you'd ordered. However, as convenient as that was, it wasn't foolproof. Sometimes the system just plain screwed up, and you only found out that the software you'd spent hours programming was lost after you tried to reload it. Sometimes people overload your tapes with other stuff. Wouldn't it be kind of nice to have a backup to your backup? Something that printed to good old paper. Nothing bad ever happens to paper, right? Yes, you need a printer. There's just one problem. There aren't any. Well, not very darned many anyway. Not in 1976. There are computer printers being produced in 1976, but most of them are expensive, commercial units, and they weigh 150 pounds. Not what you want on your wife's coffee table. Thankfully, the guys who gave you this wicked personal computer setup have just what you need. Sure, it prints on paper that's only 4 inches wide, and sure, the characters it prints almost require a microscope to read. And they did say something about not feeding it after midnight? And yeah, it's $250, which is real money. Like, a month's rent money. Ah, to heck with shelter. Backups are more important. This is a printer for average geek joes just like you in 1976. And it doesn't weigh a ton, and it doesn't cost well over a thousand dollars. This is the Southwest Technical Products Alphanumeric Printer, or PR40 for short. And today, we're gonna party like it's 1976 all over again, minus the bad haircuts. So stick around, we're about to get inked. Okay, so here is the star of the show, the Southwest Technical Products Alphanumeric Printer, model PR40. And yeah, this is um, the scariest looking printer <laughs> I've ever seen. Um, it literally terrifies me. Uh, just the, the print head on it just looks diabolical. Like it looks like it would be equally comfortable tapping out a receipt or, uh, you know, drilling a hole in your skull to see what's inside. It's just kind of, yeah, it's kind of creepy looking. And of course, this is classic Southwest Technical Products. Everything's hanging out in the open pretty much. There's no effort uh, up on the top here to make it look pretty. Obviously, there's some effort uh, to hide the electronics. You kind of need to do that. Um, you know, Southwest's design motif was it had to look amateurish. Um, it couldn't look too slick or too professional. That was a that was a directive straight from Daniel Meyer, the, the founder and, and owner of Southwest, um, because he felt, if I read correctly, that if it looked too professionally done, it would turn off people that were sort of amateur hobbyist builders. It would look too difficult to, to finish. So, yeah, this is very much a Southwest kind of deal. You know, hey, let's find a way to slap together a printer that people can use uh, to do very basic tasks and... Yeah, that's it. Um, obviously, this sort of printer has kind of limited utility. Uh, it only has uppercase for the alphabet. Um, I think it does some numbers and some punctuation. Pretty much every picture of printout that I've seen uh, coming from this printer has been basically programmed, stuff that people had typed in and wanted to retain a record of somehow. So yeah, that's basically the idea. Now, just for clarity, this is not obviously the first computer printer. The first computer printers go way back, uh, all the way 
I think even into uh, the mid-1940s and maybe possibly beyond, I've seen pictures of machines like the IBM accounting system, which was kind of a quasi-computer with a printer built into it. And then of course, in the 50s and 60s, there were those huge line printers that were connected to uh, IBM or DC or whoever's equipment. So definitely not the first computer printer, not even close. Not even the first dot matrix printer. I think the first dot matrix might have been either Centronics or Epson or, or one of those ones. Um, and of course the printhead here, as I mentioned, is borrowed from an existing printer. So obviously it doesn't quite get there. Where it might have a claim is to being the first printer that was specifically directed at the home market. Um, I was trying to sort this out and researching for this video and it's a bit mucky because a lot of people back then weren't really worried about posterity. They were more worried about keeping the lights on and selling enough product to, to do that. So I don't know exactly when this printer came out. Um, I know it was sometime in 1976. The first appearance of it was in this uh, product brochure, uh, which was for 1976. And we can see it's right here in the back. We've got a lovely color photograph, PR40 alphanumeric printer. Uh, the kit was $250 US, which, you know, that was a pretty decent price. Um, I think if you were to go with something like a Centronics uh, 101, you probably were looking at $1,100, $1,200. And again, it weighed almost 200 pounds. So um, this is definitely not 200 pounds, <laughs> which is kind of nice. And this was not uh, designed by the way specifically for Southwest gear. Obviously they hoped you would use it with that, but it was designed to be interoperable with a variety of systems. And that is why if you were to go and try and purchase one of these uh, as a collector item, like I did, you're gonna be shelling out a lot of money. Um, the cheapest I've seen one of these go for is $600 US. And it's because again, it has a tie to our friends over at Apple. In the October 1976 edition of Interface Age, Steve Jobs actually did an article which specifically mentioned uh, this printer as an option for the Apple One. So yeah, unfortunately, again, anything Apple touches turns to huge dollars. And anybody that's building an Apple One replica today, which seems like <laughs> darn near everybody, um, or somebody with an original one, if you wanna have an actual peripheral for it, um, this is kind of one of the few options. Um, you know, there were only 200 Apple ones made, so it's not like there was a big enough market for people to go building peripherals like this. So, yeah, um, it is very, very rare. It only comes up once in a while. Um, it's definitely a holy grail for me, and I'm really excited to have it. I first became aware of it um, when I was looking at old Southwest brochures like this one. And this picture in particular really influenced my collecting because I looked at this and I went, you know what? I want to own everything in this picture. I want to own that television, that AC30 unit, these kind of tape decks, uh, the printer, the GT61 graphics card, the terminal, and the computer. And I spent pretty much the next six or seven years just doing that. And I literally have everything in this photograph. Um, the only thing I don't have is the tape. Uh, <laughs> and I don't have the... Uh, Southwest chassis that was supplied for the uh, graphics card there. But I have literally everything else. I even have the Super Scope uh, tape recorders um, with the colorful buttons. And my intention was to collect all of this stuff, um, including the television there, and then reassemble it for a photo similar to this one. Just, just a fun little thing and a, and a way to sort of keep my collecting activity somewhat focused. So that's kind of the lowdown on this printer. Um, what I'll do next is I will uh, open it up here and we can see uh, Southwest's real contribution to this. Um, obviously they supplied the chassis, but the main thing that they did was supply the PCB that uh, adapted this printing mechanism to work with a general purpose computer. You know, obviously it's not perfect, but what it is is an affordable option. It was Southwest in their classic Southwest way, identifying a need and figuring out a way to make it available affordably. And yeah, that's, that's what we've got here. And I, I'm so glad I finally got one of these. I've had this thing in our collection for, I wanna say two years, and I just haven't gotten around to firing it up yet. It's just one of those things. Um, let's do a little tour here. You can see the side. 
So yeah, basically you've got your receipt paper on the back here. It feeds into this platen, platen, I'm not really sure how you pronounce that. Feeds up under there. And then the uh, print head is the really scary looking part. It kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, a radial engine from an airplane. Um, it, basically each one of these is kind of like a, a piston and when the current is passed through it, it fires a pin, which you can see, it's actually a, a wire, I think. You just see it in the, the groove there, the little channel that's cut out for it in the print head. And basically your character is generated by firing off whatever combination of these you need to, to, to form the character. And they all just kind of come out at the end here, strike the ribbon, strike the paper, and leave the impression of uh, the character. It, it is a little creepy looking, um, but you know, it's, uh, it is what it is. Another thing that makes this printing mechanism kind of an interesting choice is you can see we've got this um, rotating drum here and it's got like a track or groove cut into it. So basically what happens with that is um, as the printer is printing, the main motor is turning this drum and watch what happens as I turn it. It's gotta be real gentle. Basically what's happening is the print head is following the track here and it will eventually reach over there and then it'll start coming back this way. And that mechanism greatly simplifies the electronics and the mechanics required to make this thing operate. And that was one of the things that Southwest highlighted about it um, because you don't need a whole bunch of sensors. Uh, you don't need a whole bunch of clutches and other things uh, that are mechanically complex and likely to break down. This is a real, real simple mechanism. And you can drive the entire thing, including the ribbon spools, just with that one motor. It's all geared together. The spools have these little teeth on the bottom and as the printer prints, um, these kind of get struck on one side and it advances a little bit at a time. And then it will auto reverse and it'll start going the other way. So yeah, it's, um, it's just a cool, simple design, right? This is how Southwest like to do things. Um, so now what we'll do is I'll open up uh, the actual printer here. We can have a look at the, the real contribution that Southwest made. Not that all this stuff isn't a contribution, but the thing that uh, they did to make this possible is the PCB, the PR40B uh, circuit board. That's what they use to adapt this to computer use. I don't think this would have been used with computers back in the day. Um, I think it's a little bit too early for that. If they were using this as a receipt printer, I would think the most likely application would be something like a uh, cash register or something like that. Um, I don't think you would have seen, you know, like these days you typically see a point of sale terminal or computer and you see a little Epson printer beside it, but I don't think that's what this is because you know, computers would not have been widespread in restaurants and stuff like that in the mid 70s. So I, I think this probably came from some kind of a, a cash register. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but on the back of it there, it says LRC Inc. So I'm thinking LRC is the company that made the actual mechanism. With a little bit of research, you could probably figure out what it actually came from originally. Okay, so let's pop the bottom off here and have a look at some good old Southwest Technical Products Ingenuity. The PCB for the PR40 is a pretty simple affair. ASCII characters to be printed are presented to the first in, first out, or FIFO memory through a hex inverter. Since the printer cannot handle lowercase characters, a NAND gate converts from lower to upper case. Another NAND gate monitors the incoming data for a carriage return. If it detects it, it will send a flip-flop to go low on the falling edge of the data-ready, or input strobe, control signal. A NOR gate decodes all of the control characters and prevents them from being loaded into FIFO memory. One more NAND gate generates the data-accepted signal back to the computer whenever characters or control codes are received. The FIFO memory can hold up to 40 characters, and that provides a sort of buffer between the computer and the printer, allowing the computer to send data as fast as it needs to. When either a carriage return or the 40 character buffer is exhausted, the printer prints everything out. A complement of NAND gates, oscillator, and a divide by two flip-flop feed the dot counter and solenoid timer. Timing of the solenoids is critical. Too short and you don't get a decent impression on the page, too long and you risk overheating and burning them out. The typical timing for the solenoids is about 400 milliseconds. As the counter progresses, the selected character lines are decoded by the character ROM 
in a manner similar to that of the TV typewriter. Only, instead of feeding out dots to a video screen, we're using some buffers and Darlington drivers to fire the solenoids in a particular pattern, create the impression that we want on paper. It's a remarkably simple system, and that's what helps keep the cost down, which only broadened this little printer's appeal. As mentioned, it saw use not just for the Southwest 6800, but also the Apple I and even the Commodore PET. Now, looking at the DB25 connector on the other end of the printer's cable here, it's tempting to think that this is compatible with a PC, but uh, it's not. It isn't wired in the same way as a modern parallel PC port at all, and in fact, when I tried this, I was advised I was lucky that I didn't blow up my Toshiba's parallel port by pulling the strobe low. The Toshiba simply couldn't see anything was attached at all because it has a series of handshaking pins that need to be satisfied first. Well, I guess this is a job for my original Southwest 6800 system. Yeah, check this thing out. This is three city blocks of computer. When this machine was designed, a whole lot of innovations hadn't happened yet, so new capabilities often came in separate boxes, which in turn took up more and more of your desk or table. You know, we started out with the terminal, that was the Southwest's first computer product, um, just general purpose terminal for people. And then they developed the computer, and then they developed the AC30, because when this machine was originally developed, the standard medium for storing data was paper tape on a teletype. Uh, only a little while later, uh, the Kansas City standard uh, for tape encoding was adopted. And so they came out with this box here. And then later on, they decided, you know, people might want graphics. So that's where the graphics terminal came from. And then eventually people wanted to get away from cassette tapes into discs. So they went with a disc drive. So yeah, if you have a full blown, you know, all the trimmings 6800 system uh you need like <laughs> you need like two desks uh side by side uh, to have any hope of fitting it in. you need a big room and yeah i'm not really loving the the scene that i've set up here because uh you know i've had to set the camera so far back to capture it and it's capturing everything in the room including the the camera lights but uh yeah i mean that's that's what you have to do and i'm, I'm glad i don't have to set up the other pieces of equipment because if i did I'd have to set this thing up outside. <laughs> like it just won't fit in here. I've been wanting to get my printer out and get going with this beast for a couple of years. However, while I have two original Southwest 6800s and everything needed for a functional system, I was missing a necessary piece, the MPL or MPLA parallel card. Yeah, I could have just gone to Corsham and bought a new one, but I was being stubborn about originality. It took almost two years of searching to find one that wasn't already installed in a computer. Now, you can just go ahead and ignore the Corsham replacement I have for my original MPS serial card. I do have one of those, but it's a bit finicky, and for the purposes of getting this video done, I decided to be consistently inconsistent. The MPL and MPLA are very early parallel communications cards. There's no friendly DB25 to plug into here, just two Molex connectors, one for incoming and one for outgoing. Or, in the case of the MPLA, they can both be configured to be incoming or outgoing, depending on how you jumper it. Now, of course, it would totally make sense to actually, you know, test the card out a bit before blindly plugging in the printer and hoping it works. But that's not how I roll here. Okay, so I'm not flying totally blind. I actually did pay attention to how the card was configured to make sure I was hooked up to an output port rather than an input. On this card, it looks like A is configured as an input and B is an output. So I'll have to connect up to B, I guess. Although I did miss something crucial. Did you see it? Also, I decided it was best to actually get out the manual for this printer and trace each wire going to the DB25 so I could know exactly what each actually is. Thank goodness this cable is rainbow colored. Within a few minutes, I've got every pin noted and can see immediately why this never would have worked with a PC. The wires consist of a ground wire, seven wires for the actual character ASCII bits, and then the strobe and data accepted wire that act as a handshaking control. All I gotta do now is connect the printer. My thought is to connect little jumper wires from the connector on the card to the pins of the printer. To that end, I can use these cheap breadboarding wires I have, which come in a variety of colors I can match to those on the ribbon cable. That'll prevent my wiring dyslexia from setting in. Okay, so now I've only got one problem. The DB25 from the printer is male, and all I have on the card side is a female Molex connector. I've got no way of attaching my nice rainbow of jumper wires to this thing, as I don't have a DB25 female to female adapter, which would allow me to plug in the printer on one side and connect individual wires on the other. Darn it. Well, I do have this straight through serial cable, and it's female at both ends, and as long as the pin assignments stay the same, that should work, right? Alright, well, we've got her wired up here and ready to rock. Let's do this. 
I don't really have any software that I'm aware of that can print to the PR40 here. So for demonstration purposes, I'm gonna use Southwest's own printer diagnostic program called PrintStat number one, or something like that. Basically, it cycles through the various characters and prints each to the PR40 before reaching a carriage return, which is represented in hexadecimal as 0D. It then starts over. It also comes with a warning not to run longer than a minute or so. Apparently the printer can go on fire or something if you do. So the next thing that we're going to have to do is deal with the ribbon. So like I said, I got one of these. It was all I could find in that size of ribbon. I hope I can take this apart. And oh, what was that? Oh no! Yeah, this is one of those plastic ribbons. Oh, that drives me nuts. That's not a real ribbon. Yeah, I don't know if that's going to be problematic or not. Well, you know what? We're just going to have to make it work. Because what else can we do? Okay, so I moved the camera in so we can see the screen a little bit better. You know, there's just no way to, to capture everything in one shot. Unfortunately, it's just sort of the nature of the beast. Um, but what we will do is, uh, yeah, fire it up here. Starting up one of these computers is a bit involved because um, there's several different pieces that have to be powered up in a certain sequence to, to get things going. It's almost like kind of firing up an airplane. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to turn on is uh, the CT1024 and uh, for those of you that have watched my video on the CT1024 I made mention of this uh, particular machine uh, but it was set up in a back office and uh, it just wasn't a camera friendly space and I really didn't want to move this equipment around at the time. So yeah this is it. This is another form factor that Southwest offered. Um, this, uh, I call it the tackle box, uh, was actually a kit that they offered. Uh, some people would just put the CT1024 in the box here and then the keyboard in the keyboard case. Sometimes people would put the AC30 and the CT1024 terminal all together in this one box, which obviously would definitely be helpful uh, in terms of saving space. So we've got our terminal turned on. Now I'm going to turn on the AC30 because the AC30 is what everything flows through. That's just the way this system was set up by its original owner. And then, uh, yeah, we're gonna turn on the 1600. And you can just see it there, there's a little dollar sign. Now, one of the features of the CT1024 is uh, when you start it up, it often has junk on the screen and it does not clear the screen as you move from one screen to another. Um, it has no ability to do that. You have to clear it yourself. And unfortunately, the button here has broken off. So I'm just going to use this. And that gives us clear all the way down. So now the next thing we have to do is basically set up our program. Um, and there's a couple things that have to be done. Uh, number one is we have to enter the actual program. And then the second thing we have to do is enter in the address uh, where the card resides. Because each of the SS30 slots in the back of the computer have a specific address range assigned to them. Uh, so that you can address different uh, pieces of hardware. Uh, for the purposes of this test, I've put the card in slot number three. Uh, the slots are numbered from zero up to seven. That's just how they did it. So yeah, I've just put it in slot number three to kind of set it away from uh, the serial card, just to have a little bit of room in case I need to, to troubleshoot. Um, slot one in a 6800 is reserved for the primary communication card, so we don't touch that one. But we have any of the other six slots available. All right, let's enter our program here. It's kind of fun to enter stuff byte by byte like this. In addition to entering the program carefully, I also have to change a couple of memory addresses that tell the program what address the parallel card and printer are at. The 6800 uses addresses to reference each of its SS30 ports, similar to how a PC has addresses like COM1 and LPT1. According to our manual, the ports start at number 0, and our MPLA is plugged into port number 3, so that means I need to use address 800C according to this. And okay, here we go. Let's turn the printer on, and then drum roll, please. Nothing. Hmm. Maybe I typed something wrong. Let's try that again. 
Nope. All right, well, that's par for the course for this channel. Time to break out my trusty old logic probe and see if we're getting any action or what. Yeah, zilch. One weird thing though, there is some kind of activity it seems on the handshaking lines. I'm gonna pull those out of the card here and test the wires individually just to see if hard is driving it or the printer. Okay, not the card. Again, I'm not an expert on diagnosing uh, parallel port issues on 1970s equipment, but I feel like it probably shouldn't be doing that. Because um, one of these lines theoretically should be coming from the computer. So I feel like there might be an IC that's out of whack here. Man, so many possibilities. One is that the printer is just dead. I am applying modern expectations here, but I don't like how silent it is when you turn it on, other than that creepy jolt the printer head does. And this being vintage 70s equipment, I'm expecting some buzzing at least at a minimum. Eh, I mean, maybe there's just nothing going on there. Of course, there's also possibly myriad problems on the computer side. I really don't know if this card actually works or not. They're pretty simple in design and there's a high likelihood the card is fine, but it is 40 years old, so maybe not. So yeah, why don't we go back to basics here. Let's check out this parallel card thoroughly before assuming it's fit to drive a printer. Now thankfully, Southwest gave us a little test program to help out here as well. It's called Parent-1, and if I'm reading right here, basically what you do is connect the output of the card back to the input. The program will take our keystrokes, fire them out the output of the card, which will then be read back into the input. The program will then interpret what was sent and print it back out on the screen. And in that spirit, let's return the configuration of the card to something more along Southwest's expectations. That means switching port A from an input to an output and port B from an output to an input. That'll make things a little easier for me in terms of following Southwest directions. This is done by changing two jumper wires. Each side of the card has a jumper marked I or O. I means input and O means output. The letter following just refers to which port it affects. So, according to Southwest, I need to move the jumper wire here over to OA to make A an output, and then for port B, move over to IB to make B an input. Voila! Next, I need to make some short jumper wires to connect over from one port to the other. I'm going to use more of these breadboarding wires like so, keeping things multicolored so it's easy to keep track. We don't need to connect the two handshaking pins, C1 and C2, the program lets us get around that. We just want to see that the data bits being sent and received line up properly. Now with the card all wired up, we can proceed to enter the Parent program. I'm just going to check it over one more time to make sure all the data was entered correctly. And yeah, looks good to go. So let's see what happens. Uh, hmm, this doesn't look right. I mean, I'm seeing characters echoed back that match what I'm typing, but I'm getting a load of extraneous stuff with it. I'm not sure, is this program actually running? Yeah, it must be. If it weren't, and I hit a key like M, the computer would respond to it as a function. But when the program is running, it just throws up this gobbledygook whenever I type. Hmm, what's going on here? Okay, so I went to VCFed, and Dave over there most helpfully suggested making a change to the program. Apparently the program, as Southwest has it, has one little boo-boo. It isn't actually suppressing local echo from my keystrokes. So what I'm seeing as the first correct character for what I type may not actually be the output from the parallel card. It may be simply the computer echoing back my keystrokes. Making this change will suppress that. Okay, let's try this again. We'll enter the newly modified program and cross fingers. Here we go. Okay, so yeah, now the good characters are gone. So that must have been the computer echoing back, which means something isn't working right with the parallel card. Again, par for the course for this channel. So yeah, it's consistent. Uh, each thing I type comes back with the same character. It's just totally the wrong character. What the heck is going on here? So I went back to VCFed and asked Dave what he thought, and Dave said, looking at the binary data, it appeared the card was actually putting out the opposite bits for the ASCII character of what I was actually typing. So that got us to looking more closely at the card, and that's when Dave pointed out something I'd missed. In addition to the 6820 PIA chip that does all the communicating, there are also supposed to be five DM8833 chips that serve as transceivers. It turns out that while the A side has the 8833s installed, the B side actually has DM8835s. The chips are functionally similar, however, the 8835 inverts all the data it receives before sending it out, 
making it the opposite of whatever came in. Thus, if I typed an A, the 8835 changed it into this. Okay, well, that's not the end of the world, really. That sort of confirms that the basic card is functional. As long as we stick with using A as an output, we really shouldn't have a problem here. So, back to the printer. Now, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I made a major boo-boo when I was probing the printer's handshaking wires, trying to figure out what was going on. Remember I said I had what looked like activity there? Well, <laughs> that may have been a false positive. You see, I had the logic probe connected to the 6800 computer for power. However, when using a logic probe, you do usually want to have it powered off the device you're testing. Sure enough, with the computer removed from the equation and the probe connected to the actual printer, we get a very different result. We'll just turn it on there. You can see, we're getting nothing. There's nothing whatsoever. All these wires, we get a reaction, but not the strobe or the data accepted. There's no activity at all on either pin, and that's exactly how it should be. Also, it turns out in looking over the parallel board, I completely missed a glaringly obvious problem. A huge chunk of track was missing right over here. So yeah, and this happens to be the track that connects the C1 pin to the transceiver at IC7. So without that, yeah, it's no wonder we're not getting any handshaking signals, stupid. So yeah, we'll just patch that with some wire here and we'll see if that helps us. Another thing suggested to me by VC Fed Dave is to attach a 1K resistor to C1 on the output side and then modify the parallel testing program accordingly. What this will do when it's tied to the 5 volt line is it'll actually stop the program when it reaches character 0D, which is a carriage return. I guess this will tell us if anything is working with the test program. We'll also modify the test program to ignore handshaking, otherwise it won't send anything to the output port. So yeah, let's re-enter it here and fire it up again here. Yeah, not stopping. Not surprised. However, for once I've got my logic probe hooked up right and I can see the activity happening on the bit pins of the parallel card's output, so that's a good sign that stuff is going on. Alright, so I don't think I'm going to dwell too much on the fact that the program isn't stopping as expected when it hits carriage return. I think I've demonstrated two things here. Uh, number one is that the card appears to be basically functional and that the printer doesn't have any indicators that it's having its own issues. So I think I'm just going to hook it up again here and try starting the test program again. I don't know why, but I'm actually feeling kind of lucky. I'm going to leave the ribbon off as I'm three quarters expecting this just isn't going to work, but who knows. I'm going to be able to enter this program in my sleep. Okay. So that's that. Eight zero zero eight. That's set correctly. Turn the printer on. I have no idea what's going to happen here. Aha! Well, that's interesting. That definitely got a reaction, but uh, huh? Okay, let's stop. Yes, it reacted. It kind of jammed there, but it definitely reacted. That's a huge deal. That means we have some operability. Okay, let me just move the drum back a bit here, just in case it's binding on something. The instructions for the printer did say you really shouldn't move the drum manually, as the printhead is supposed to rest at a position just to the left of center. But since this feels like a mechanical issue, I'll risk it. Alright, here we go again. It's totally working. It's totally printing stuff. Not really intelligible stuff though, but it is trying. Hmm, well this is interesting. Even with no ribbon, we've got some light blue characters showing up. I'm thinking this receipt paper must be some kind of carbonless type or something because there's no way the printhead would still have residual ink after 40 years. The characters themselves are mostly a mash, so we may have some issues to deal with here. But I'm hopeful because check out this one line here. This one line is perfect and is what the printer should be putting out. So maybe things are sticking a bit or some adjustments are needed. All right, let's spool things up here, literally. I'm going to remove the cheap plastic ribbon I was thinking of using and put some actual ribbon onto this thing now that I've found one that fits. Finding the right width of ribbon was a little bit tricky. A lot of manufacturers go by model of printer rather than offering any specs about the ribbon. But I did manage to find one by Okidata and it is nylon, so that'll do the job. The ribbon in this cart is a bit on the short side, and that's because the cart has a re-inking system inside that continuously adds ink to the ribbon as it's pulled through. 
Once upon a time when I had my ribbon remanufacturing business, I had to pop those reservoirs open, which are basically just a sponge, and add more ink along with new ribbon. Anyway, with the ribbon wrapped around our spools here, we can return it to the printer and finally get some legible printing. All right, let's try again here. And now we are going to initiate our program for ready for this. Here we go. Hmm. So, hmm. yeah, now it's all garbage now. So what's going on here? I can see the characters, but it's not getting, I feel like it should be going across the page like it did before. It's like it's, uh, like it's binding on something. Now there are some resistors inside the printer that control width and such. R17 specifically handles how far across the paper the printhead will print. So I'm gonna try adjusting that bad boy and see what happens. Nope. Okay, you know what? Maybe this problem is a bit more obvious than that. Maybe this is just simply a lubrication problem. This printer has sat for probably decades and the grease in the drum in particular looks pretty dry. So I'm going to try a dollop of lithium grease and see what happens, both in the channel of the drum here as well as the bar the printhead moves across. And then I'll work it in a bit here and then we'll try another test. Alright, here we go for all the marbles. So I've got my program loaded and now we're ready to fire it up. I'm going to turn the printer on. There it goes. J A 4 Get ready. A is for action. Here we go. Yes. Yes. That's what I was looking for. Look at that. It's actually working. So the only problem I can see is these, uh, Spools. I kind of got to keep my finger on it or it's not uh, turning. There's basically a little bar here and it hits the sprocket on the bottom of the spool and that's what advances the ribbon. And then eventually when it hits the end it'll reverse and then it'll start hitting the other one. I thought this thing would be chipping out characters like a Flintstone typewriter but no it actually seems to move at a pretty good clip. All right well let's stop it and inspect the merchandise. Yep, those are fully formed lines of characters, folks, and they look awesome. Yeah, I'm totally happy with this result. Distinguished members of the audience, we have ourselves a fully working Southwest PR40 printer, and this is probably the only video on YouTube that actually shows such a thing. No longer do I have to imagine what it would sound or operate like. It's happening right here. Anyway, that's kind of it for our video. I wish I could try printing some other stuff, but unfortunately I just don't have software that really takes advantage of it. Maybe for a future video, I'll try building that Commodore pet adapter and see if I can utilize this thing there. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. I was really glad to have you guys along on this journey, and we will definitely see you in the next video.